Well, if you just showed up here for the first time in the last two or three weeks, you'll, know, you'll need to know that we're in the end of a series of sermons that we've been doing on happy. How many felt happier since we've done that? Come on, everybody raise your hand, just make me feel better. Thank you, I appreciate it. <laughs> Lie if you have to, make the preacher feel better. Um, yeah, and, and uh, here, here's the, what, this is the answer to the question, remember? What makes you happy? No thing makes you happy. Did I catch you off guard? Let's do that together. No thing makes you happy. Uh, and, and, for, and maybe I ought to rem- be reminded, uh, help rem- I sometimes forget to do this, that this is a series of sermons that, that we've t- t- taken from North Point. And uh, we've kind of condensed them and turned them into three where they had six. But we, we wanted to follow this idea because happy is important to many of you. And we want to remind you of how the Bible teaches us to be happy. And no thing is going to make us happy. In fact, what we discovered is that happy uh, comes from a relationship or two. Right? It's in having peace in our relationships peace in our relationship with God, peace in our relationship with others, peace in our relationship with with ourselves. And and that's not something that just falls on us. We learned in the first sermon that that kind of relationship is sown. It's something that we build. It's by making one decision upon another decision upon another decision that enables us to find that kind of happy. Uh, and, and, and so those of us who are waiting for happy to happen uh, find ourselves disappointed because happy comes over time. It comes over from having a hunger and thirst for righteousness. It comes from doing the things that are right. It has a passion for other people. And so it's one decision at a time that we sow happiness. How many remember the show, I Dream of Jeannie? Do you remember that goofy show? This, this astronaut finds a bottle on the edge of a beach, and in it is a genie. Not just any genie. You have to remember how old I was when genie came out of the bottle. <laughs> that was a genie. That was a genie. Yeah. And I could never figure out why he couldn't figure that out. She was a genie. He could have anything he wanted. As a a young teenager, you know how my mind went? I thought of all kinds of things that I would want, and he couldn't figure that out. I could never figure out why uh, Major Nelson could never figure out he had a genie on a bottle. There was a guy in uh, our town, a little town that I lived in, who had a uh, 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 roadrunner car. It was a Dodge Roadrunner. It was the hottest thing I ever saw in my life. And I thought, how cool would it be to have a Roadrunner? I had a bicycle. Yeah. And I thought, I would have the girls if I had the Roadrunner. There was a guy in my town who uh, was a varsity basketball player. He was a star. And he had a good-looking girlfriend. And I thought, if I could be a basketball star like him, I could get a girlfriend like that. That would be so cool. I'd make the genie do that. I'd have the genie do that. And how cool would it be to have all the money you wanted? I mean, you could just say, genie, I need a 20. And you'd have several 20s. Did your your mind ever play that? If I just had one more thing. If I just had the car that that guy had, if I, if I just had the house that that family has, or if I just had the children that that guy has, okay, or if I just had the spouse that that guy has, or if I just had the health that that gal has, or, or if I could just have the job that they have, um, then life would be happy, right? How many of us do that? Sure we do. Absolutely we do. Because we're taught that if we had one more thing, we would have 
happiness. Happy. Happiness is not in things, though. We know that intuitively. And, and so we, we find ourselves wishing for things and hoping for things and, and planning for things because we think things are going to make us happy. And then we discover that that one more thing really didn't help us that much, be that much more happy. And, and, and we're still stuck with us, and we're still stuck with our relationships, and we're still stuck with trying to figure out who God is. Let me give you a clue. If you had everything that you could wish from a genie, and it was all about you, and you had all of your wants and wishes met, guess what? You would still struggle to be happy. If you had a genie in the bottle, and she granted you every wish you had, you would still struggle to be happy. Do you know why? Because you're not enough to make yourself happy. You caring for you alone will never enable you to be happy. The Bible teaches that happy comes not when we take care of ourselves, but when we take care of others. Isn't that strange? Here's what Jesus did. Gathered with his disciples in the upper room on the night in which he would be betrayed. And he's standing around, and, and, and here's what I believe happened. It doesn't say this. It's what I believe happened. I, I believe that there's this pettiness going on in the life of the disciples about who's the most important. Who, who, who gets to sit at the right hand and the left hand of God? You know? And who's going to be the best generals when Jesus has his kingdom? And, and, and they know that Jesus is coming to a crisis point by the way he's talking and the way things are going on. And so they're all, they're all priming themselves who's going to be the biggest and who's going to be the best. And here's what I believe happened. I, I believe that uh, Peter came into the room and sat down beside Jesus. And he was asked to move. I believe Jesus wanted Judas to be there. And so Peter's in a snit, and he goes to the clear end of the table. You ever see a kid do that? They're, gonna, they're just going to sit in the clear end of the table, and they're pout. And the reason I think that is because later Peter isn't close enough to ask Jesus who, who he thinks is going to betray him. He's got to ask John who's going to betray him because he took the end of the table because he's down there having a snit. And, and uh, so he needs John to talk to Jesus because he's not close enough. And, of course, we know that Judas and John are beside him because the Bible tells us that. And, and so I think there's a, this atmosphere going on in the, around the table of who's the best and who's the most important. And here's how Jesus resolves that. Have, have you, has parents ever done this? He gets up and he takes off his outer garment and he wraps himself in a towel. And he gets a pan of water and he starts washing the disciples' feet. Can you imagine Jesus, our Lord, washing your feet? How many think that that's icky anyways? You know, I don't want people messing with my feet. And there's Jesus doing that icky job. Because feet in those days would have been, yeah, really icky. Yeah. Uh, and so... There he is, and, and we know that's a servant's job. And, and so uh, Peter even protests. Peter says, I don't want you to do this. And he goes, buddy, i got to do this. This is the way it works. And he goes, well, then go ahead and do it. And, and so he gets done, and he, he takes the towel off, and he gets his outer garment back on, and he, and he makes this comment, and you've got to know this comment. Now listen, this, I just took on a servant's job. If I, your Lord and Master, and willing to do this, then you must wash one another's feet. And listen to this. Now that you know this, you ought to do this. That's my translation. But now that you know this, you ought to do this. And then he says this, and that's cri critical for our sermon. Now that you know this, you ought to do this. And if you do this, you will be blessed. Did you see it? 
It may go around you because we're not paying attention. It, you will be blessed. It's the exact same word that we read in chapter 5 when we read the Beatitudes. Blessed is he, blessed is he, blessed is he. It's the exact same word, and we translate that word happy. Happy. And it's not just, you know, I, I feel good. It's the kind of happy, and we translate this Greek word, it's the kind of happy that... That God has so blessed you, so bestowed upon you His peace, so given you His joy that other people go, wow, I, I, I admire that person's life because of the joy and the peace that they have. They are so happy that I can't ima- I, I, I want to be like that. That's the kind of happy that God blesses this person with. And, and, and did you see what, you, what he said? He said, when you serve other people like I have just served you, you will learn how to be happy. It's not happy because I take care of myself. It's happy when I learn to take care of others. When I serve others, I get happy. When I empty my cup, listen to me, when I am willing to empty my cup into you, my cup gets fuller. When I am willing to serve you and care for you, I am honored. In other words, the less I take care of myself, the more I take care of myself. Isn't that crazy? Who designed that? But here's what we know. In the last 20 years, for some reason, in the last 20 years, happy has been a research project. We never talked about happy before as it being important, but the last 20 years, study after study after study has been done about happy. Go figure. You can get a grant from the government if you want to take a study on on happy. Just saying, if you're without something to do. And here's what we've learned. If you serve people, if you're, if you're a volunteer and you're helping other people, if you're giving your time to other people, it reduces your stress. It reduces your blood pressure. It, it enables you to have more peace. It enables you to live better and live longer if you're somebody who volunteers. Isn't that nuts? Who designed that? It, Here's what we know. We, we know that if a teenager is being trained to be a volunteer, there's less teenage pregnancies. There's less drug and alcohol issues. Grades go up. And children, children have a greater appreciation for authority if we can just teach them to volunteer. Here's a clue. If you're a parent of a child, force your kid to volunteer. They're going to they're gonna protest about something. Right? They're a teenager. They're going to throw a fit about something. Let them throw a fit about the fact that they've got a volunteer, and, and you're going to change your kid simply by inviting your kid to be a volunteer. How cool is that? Here's another research that's been done. And you can Google every one of these. Another research that was done is, is people who have, uh, are struggling with cancer find that they become healthier when they're able to volunteer. They're, 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 here's the, here's the, what we find. When you volunteer, you improve your immune system. You can get, you can get less sick if you volunteer. You can get healthier if you're a volunteer. And some of it is psychological because you take your mind off who? You, you take your mind off who? You, and you give it to somebody else, and you find yourself feeling better about the world just by volunteering. In other words, when I think less of myself and think more of others, I help myself more. Who thought of that? I mean, how crazy is that? Who designed us to be like that? Anybody got a clue? You see, that's the, that's the point. The point is, that's how you were designed. 
God created you, God created you with an internal uh, uh, presence that says, I am to help others. I am to serve others. I am to give myself away to others. And when we live into the design that God has given to us, as God has made in us, then, then we begin to live better because we're doing what God created us to do. Let, let, let me say it this way. What does sin do? Well, sin makes us self-centered. Sin makes us selfish. Sin makes us think of ourselves. Sin, here we go, ready, separates us from the three relationships that are most significant to us. Separates us from God. Separates us from others. And it actually separates us from ourselves. We, we don't care for ourselves. We don't, we don't love ourselves. We, we, we think that we do because we're being so selfish, but in fact, we're going against how God created us, and we really aren't happy when we're self-centered and selfish. But when we serve God and we sow in service, we empty our cups and discover that we're fuller than ever before. Let me invite you to look at the key verse for me in this study, and that is in Matthew. I'm going to look up the page. It's 900 and something. Uh, no, 751. It's Matthew. 751. Matthew 22, 37. 751. <clears throat> I want you to pay attention how we're designed. Twenty-two thirty-seven. it's page 751. And Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. But a second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. You see, the first commandment is to love God. The second commandment is to love others, and you'll love others when you know how to love your, yourself. And what's crazy about that is that the more you think of serving others, is the better you feel about yourself. And the more you give yourself away, the happier you become. And if you can figure out how to be a servant like Jesus, you will be blessed. You will be happy in such a way that other people will see it and they'll go, wow, how are they so happy? Now, think about it for just a second. I was down at the hospital here recently, and uh, uh, a gentleman has just had open heart surgery, and his daughter is, is fussing about him. His daughter, uh, who's in her 30s, and, and she's, she's still crying, and she's still working that out. And you know what she says? I love my daddy. Isn't that cool? I love my daddy. Who wouldn't want to hear that? Come on, dads. Wouldn't that be cool? I love my daddy. And, 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 and she said that because she said, my daddy is the selfish man in the, in the world. He, he's, he just takes care of himself. He just thinks about himself. He, he is just so self-centered and hatred. And you think that's the reason she said that? No. No. My daddy loves me, and he, he helps me, and he thinks about me, and he serves me, and on and on and on, and, and I, I thought he was second to uh, St. Augustine, because she loves her daddy, because he has learned to serve her. You ever been at a funeral where they said, this was a great guy, he was selfish and self-centered? No, nobody says that. They say he was a great guy because he gave himself away. She was a great lady because she learned to serve her family and her community and her church well. 
And it's those testimonies that we repeat over and over when it comes to giving testimony about the value of someone's life. And trust me, they were happy to do it. And you know that. It's more than you. It's got to be more than you if you want to be happy. You've got to learn how to empty your cup into someone else's. You need to learn to serve if you wish to be blessed. You need to learn to give yourself away so that you can be happy. I can't end this sermon without taking just a moment and thanking the hundreds of people that surround this church with their service. There are literally hundreds of people who day in and day out give their time, their volunteerism, their service to the work of this church, caring for people, ministering to people, keeping the organization running. I just want to thank you so very much. You are amazing people. I see you at the hospitals. I see you at Fish. I see you here and there all over the place because you've learned the value of serving. Thank you. Thank you so very much. You are the best of the best. And I am honored to be a part of you. Thank you for your service. I pray for you daily. Let me pray for you now. Father, thank you so very much for the amazing gift of service. Because you designed us to be people who give ourselves away. May we learn how to be happy. May we learn how to serve you. And may in our service, we discover what it means to be just like you. May we hear these things and do them. And we pray for our servants, all the servants that are, are part of our organization, those who, who give a lot and those who give a little. We, we have our, are appreciative of every ounce of energy that they give us and all the time they give us and all the things that they do. And I just, I just pray that they are happy beyond happy. They are blessed because they have learned to serve. And I pray that in your holy name. Amen.